I wonder about, you know, I said Gary Gensler's tough approach, but it really seems like a nuclear approach, right? I mean, he has been telling all the players in crypto, you're welcome to come in and register, but there seems to be no path to do that. Um, why do you think that the SEC seems to want to stamp out this business in America? I mean, I think there's been a lot, a lot of instances with lacks of disclosure that are clearly troubling for crypto. There's no doubt about that, right? That's what uh, Chair Gensler says on a repeated basis. Um, I do think it's hard to form fit and enforce fit crypto into this established regulatory framework when it's so fundamentally different in a lot of ways. There are things that are similar, there's no doubt. Um, I don't know exactly why. I think it's very troubling for American uh, capital markets. You look at the rest of the world going in the completely opposite direction, not just trying to stamp it out, but in the UK and Hong Kong and Dubai, uh, in, in Europe, actually enacting and working on progressive regulations that, that businesses can work with. Meanwhile, in the US, we have this sort of broad-based attack on the industry. Yeah, in fact, we saw um, the CEO of Coinbase talking to the former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer today, saying, you know what, we everything's on the table. We might move our business out of the U.S. eventually. And we've heard, you know, Marathon Digital and a number of other businesses say the same thing. Do you think we're going to see an exodus of a crypto business out of the U.S.? I really hope not, Matt. Um, it's, I think there's a lot about cryptocurrency and public blockchains that really aligns with American values, openness, liberty, sovereignty, um, capital markets, free markets. I think that would be a huge loss for the U.S., especially at a time when we're clearly entering a more multipolar world. You know, I look at what Congress is working on now in the House Financial Services Committee, the stablecoin uh, legislation, I think, if done correctly, could be extremely additive and supportive to the U.S. dollar. And not only in expanding the reach of the dollar, but also supporting, uh, creating a new marginal buyer of U.S. debt, which I think would be really positive for the country. Yeah, Alex, it's Kaylee in Washington. I actually just returned from Capitol Hill where I was in the financial services hearing with Gary Gensler. I'll be at that stablecoin hearing tomorrow. I wonder how, though, even if we do get some form of legislation on the stablecoin front, you ultimately see that interacting with something uh, akin to a CBDC, some kind of digital dollar. We're actually just getting a headline out from uh, Michelle Bowman of the Federal Reserve saying she doubts the benefit of a U.S. central bank digital currency. Are we not even going to see that happen? Do stablecoins serve that role? I think that's a great question. No one really knows the answer. You saw the Boston Fed had done a lot of work with MIT on one way to do a CBDC, Kaylee. Um, I think a, a you know sort of public, publicly regulated and um, properly transparent, privately issued stablecoin uh, could easily serve that role uh, in, in uh, the U.S. market. And globally, it would support the dollar. If you recall, Chairman Powell has repeatedly said that he doesn't want to disintermediate the two-tiered banking system, which to me has always implied sort of a tepid or even ambivalence on behalf of uh, at least federal leadership over issuing a CBDC. I'm not really sure what, what we mean by a CBDC yet, and it's really not clear whether they do either. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a very good point. And of course, as we all have these ongoing regulatory conversations, ultimately, does it actually matter for market pricing? Because we continue to see new players slapped with enforcement actions. It seems the crackdown is continuing. Bitcoin and other digital assets don't really seem to be blinking. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is probably the best performing asset of the year. Now, obviously, last year was a different story for cryptos and, and also a lot of other things. Um, you got to remember, it's a global asset class, right? We have a lot of capital and, and allocators in the U.S., no doubt, that are impactful for these markets as well as many others. But um, there are people all around the world that own and, and trade and use cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, it's hard to look. I, I think if you look at some of the recent actions, they're extremely U.S. specific. And again, it's not just that other countries aren't um, moving in sort of as restrictive a manner. You have a countries moving in the opposite direction. And we're talking about, you know, Western countries and countries with advanced capital markets doing so. There are coins. Um, Algorand is an example I can think of that um, it makes sense. The price would appreciate as the product they're building on that blockchain, um, you know, improves. Bitcoin isn't one of those, right? It's, it's really just a store of value. Um, uh, asset. Why do you think we've seen the price increase from you know 16,000 directly after FTX to 30,000 today? Great question, Matt. I think of Bitcoin typically as like a non-sovereign FX. Very hard. People ask how to value Bitcoin, and so there's no cash flows or there's it's not an equity, right? And and how do you value a foreign currency? Well, typically against something else, right? And obviously that's how Bitcoin trades. I think. Last year was obviously a major deleveraging event for crypto in general and Bitcoin. I think at the beginning of this year, you saw Bitcoin at 16.6. I think a lot of people realized that that was really the product of inorganic forced selling. 
um, and to start the year, it just looked low. And you'd had, you'd had an equities rally leading into the end of last year, right in the beginning of this year. And I think there was initial catch-up trade. And then I would say we at Galaxy had one of our biggest trading days ever the day the, the market opened after Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank closed. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's absolutely a narrative where Bitcoin, which is open and unseizable and transparent, um, really contrasts with the state of the banking system, not just here, but in general. I buy, I buy that totally from a retail standpoint, right? For um, the guy who's on Reddit and really believes in the origin story of Bitcoin and is a fan of, you know, freedom and... But from the... Um, from from the institutional side, what are you hearing? And you're yeah. one of the best positioned people to to tell us what the institutional feeling is on these assets. I mean, are they holding? Are they back in? Are inst is institutional adoption still yeah. to come? It's a great question. We saw it get really interesting, right? We've gone through a lot of phases just in the last couple months. 16.6 to start the year, there was still a lot of despair in the institutional crowd, those that were interested in, in crypto. Um, at, at 20 and 25, you started to see the people who had gotten interested but either not allocated or had gotten out in 2022, they started you know, picking up the phone and asking questions. At 30, they're starting to knock on the door and we've already seen some chunky allocations from traditional institutional investors this year. Um, I think we'll see more, but I mean, it's a function of momentum as well. I mean, we, I really do think if we start to move beyond 30, uh, in, you know, north of 30, you'll start to see people banging that door down. And that's on Bitcoin. If we could also just talk about Ether now that the Shanghai upgrade has been completed. I was just saying it's north of, of $2,000. How fundamentally important is that to the trajectory of Ether going forward? I think it is important, Kaylee. The Shanghai and Capella upgrades was the completion of that long-awaited merge upgrade where Ethereum transitioned from proof of work to proof of stake. So just that milestone alone, I mean, this was something like seven years in the making, this upgrade. Um, that's an achievement. I think that made a lot of people feel really comfortable. They can now move on to developing the things that they really want on Ethereum, which are scalability to enhance rollups and all these other layer two types of things, sort of actual features as opposed to just sort of this big, long-awaited transition. Um, it also alters the economics of the chain in general, right? It enables unstaking. Um, so now you don't have this weird supply lockup thing. The sort of free market can really do its thing. I think it de-risked um, investing in ETH or at least staking your ETH if you are an investor. For sure. Significantly. You got to be able to get it in, out, right? I, I would <laughs> think so. Put it in. You want to pull, pull it out as well. Yeah.